Hello and welcome to the Curated Conversations webinar series brought to you by the Master of Arts in Museum Studies and Cultural Heritage Management Programs and the Johns Hopkins University Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features a discussion with Timothy Ann Burnside and Kilolu Luckett on community-centered curatorial practice. My name is Peter Huggins and I'm the event producer. Please note today's event will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Curated Conversations playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function, and we will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to our moderator, Dr. Stephanie Brown, Assistant Program Director and Senior Lecturer for the Master of Arts in Museum Studies program. Thank you so much, Peter. It's great to be here with everybody. And we're so excited to have so many people joining us today. It's really a treat. Um, and I and I took a peek at the at the list of registrants, and we've got current students, we've got alums, we've got faculty, we've got friends of the program. Um, it's really fabulous to have you all, to have you all with us and to be able to have what I think is going to be a really great conversation. Um, so our two panelists are these two fabulous women that were able to find time in their schedules to be with us. Um, Timothy Ann Burnside is, uh, well, the most important thing about Tim, there are two important things about Timothy you need to know. One is that she's an alum of our program. And the other is that I think she knows Beyonce. Um, so she is an accomplished museum professional with 20 years of experience at the Smithsonian Institution. Her work explores intersections between history and culture through the lenses of music and performing arts by the acquisition, research, and interpretation of material culture. She builds collections inclusive of diverse and unique objects and develops exhibitions that provide engaging and educational experiences. In addition to curatorial work and exhibition development, Timothy's background includes historical research, archival work, collections management, exhibition installation, and program production. Her unique professional perspective fuels her exploration of museums, changing roles and responsibilities, and evolving methodologies in the field. Timothy began her career with Smithsonian at National Museum of American History in 2003 as an intern, and then became a curatorial assistant for the Division of Cultural History. She worked with the Jazz Appreciation Month program for two years. Um, she launched the Smithsonian's first hip hop initiative and began building a collection. She moved to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2009 to join the curator curatorial team developing the museum's collections and exhibitions. She's contributed to multiple uh, NMAHC inaugural exhibitions, including musical crossword, uh, crossroads, sports, leveling the playing field, taking the stage, cultural expressions, power place. Um, watching Oprah, the Oprah Winfrey show was part of her work, uh, a show on hip hop photography. She's produced and contributed to diverse award-winning projects, including Smithsonian Folklife Festival's Rhythm and Blues, Tell It Like It Is, uh, the NMAHC's Grand Opening Festival, Freedom Sounds, Community Celebration, um, recent projects include the inaugural NMAHC Hip Hop Block Party, which should be on all of our bucket list. Uh, the publication Musical Crossroads, Stories Behind the Objects of African American Music, and the NMAHC's newest exhibition, Afrofuturism, A History of Black Futures. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you. So fun. Always so fun to see you. And our guest in conversation with Timothy is the amazing Kololo Luckett, who I met for the first time uh, last January, February, when she was curating a show at my hometown museum, Granolda House Museum of American Art in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And um, as soon as I heard her start to speak, I thought, oh, oh, we have to talk. So Kololo is a Pittsburgh-based art historian and curator with over 25 years of experience in arts administration and cultural production. She is committed to elevating the voices of underrepresented visual artists, especially black and brown artists. Luckett is founding executive director and chief curator of Alma Lewis, 
named after abstract artist Alma Thomas and Norman Lewis, an experimental contemporary art platform for critical thinking, constructive dialogue, and creative expressions dedicated to Black culture. Among the many exhibitions to her credit are Familiar Boundaries, Infinite Possibilities, Resurgence, Rise Again, The Art of Ben Jones, I Came by Boat, So Meet Me at the Beach by Ayana Evans and Seve Makonen, uh, Vanishing Black Bars and Lounges, Photographs by El Kasimu Harris, and Dominic Chambers, Like the Shapes of Clouds on Water at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center, and Amani Lewis, Reimagining Care. Uh, current last year's exhibition uh, at Alma Lewis was Luziana Lazania Cruz performing inquiry, and uh, Kalola recently co-curated Slay, Artemisia Gentileschi, and Kahindi Winery at the Frick Art Museum in Pittsburgh. Uh, Lucky has curated exhibitions by national and international artists, um, and served as art commissioner for the City of Pittsburgh's Art Commission for twelve years. She's held positions as curator of Meta Pittsburgh's Open Arts, consulting curator of visual arts at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center, director of development at the Andy Warhol Museum, and curatorial assistant at Wood Street Galleries, where she helped organize shows that included Zhu Bing, Louise Bourgeois, Larry Bell, Catherine Opie, Nam June Pike, and Tim Rollins and KOS. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Bomb, Hyperallergic, Just Oppose, Hype Beast, and Sever, among others. Welcome, Kalolo. I'm so glad that we get to do this together. Um, so this is how we're going to do it. Um, we will hear first from Timothy about her work and then from Kalolo. Um, they'll each sort of give us an overview of their curatorial projects, their curatorial processes, their curatorial, curatorial philosophies. Um, and then the three of us will be in some conversation together. Um, and after that, we will open it up and um, ask some of your questions. Um, and I'm sure that those questions are going to be rich and thoughtful and uh, provocative and are going to build our conversation even further. So um, without any any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Timothy. So it's all yours. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. I um, am always happy to take any opportunity to chat with students in this program, considering I came um, through it um, successfully. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I'm just grateful. especially interested in talking about um, this idea of community within curatorial work um, and how that has changed and evolved um, over time. Um, and I don't know what you all are seeing on the screen, but if you are seeing um, images, um, uh, I kind of, well, there's my top slide, of course. Um, what I wanted to do today was just provide some background images for you as I'm talking in my five to seven minutes um, that give you a little bit of um, behind the scenes uh, glimpse into the, what the work often is. And so there are images that tell stories within um, them around uh, relationships primarily and um, different examples of work being done. So we're just kind of gonna go through, um, our, our Peter is helping us out. You'll see objects from, um, as here, Andre 3000, considering it's hip hop 50, I threw in Chuck D, Jay Dilla, Rakim, also En Vogue, Nona Hendrix, um, Soul Train, Celia Cruz, that's Michael Jackson, and many others. Um, and some of them are taken as this one was behind the scenes backstage at a concert the night that Rakim donated this microphone. Later on, you may see me actually putting the thing in um, the case. Uh, so this is often demonstrating relationships that have spanned over a decade sometimes. Um, and it's not just with the with the exhibitions. Um, there are also moments, or I'm packing things as this, these are En Vogue dresses. It's also, um, the programs, it's also publications, it's also oral histories, and 
consistent engagement with our object donors over many, 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 many years. Um, so for example, throughout the slides, you'll see pictures of me and Nona Hendricks first meeting in 2013 and her beautiful silver costume, you know, kind of shoved in a corner in a storage unit versus finally her coming to see that costume on display in Afrofuturism just this past month. Um, so the work that we do um, in, in terms of public engagement and that role as a public servant and um, the role that museums play is I personally take it incredibly seriously, but there's so much that happens, you know, again, behind the scenes. The idea that um, this is all possible because of uh, very intentional work done by so many people and the role of a curator, the role of the person kind of guiding these conversations is constantly changing. Um, I consider when I began um, at the Smithsonian 20 years ago, I was an intern and I was, as interns should be doing, soaking up as much as I possibly could at every opportunity. Um, and, I, and I really started to pay attention to the work that was being done, how it was being done, and what I thought um, was missing, not just in terms of stories and content, but um, perspectives and um, the kind of different ways that that folks could enter conversations. And so fast forward to um, our fearless leader here at the museum and now secretary of the entire Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, um, inviting me to join his staff in 2009 um, to create this museum. And um, I am very uh, grateful for um, all of the experience I had in American history that set me up. Uh, for this moment. This photograph is example, I'm filming a commercial for the Smithsonian with Rakim to a year before the museum opened versus our initial meeting in like 2008 or something. Um, and so I was able to take my uh, very eclectic skill set um, as not just a, a content person in terms of research and curatorial kind of perspectives and telling stories, but also um, object handling. Um, I was trained as an archivist. Um, I, I, as you can see in these photos, that's kind of why I wanted to share them, not to say like, here's me doing all this stuff, but like, this is the work. <laughs> this is the behind the scenes part of it all that um, whether you're interviewing someone for an oral history, as you see here, or physically putting things in cases or um, giving tours and sharing the content, um, the way this museum was created is so different and I think really speaks well to um, this shift. We were simultaneously creating uh, a, a new place, a new physical space. We were building a brand new collection. We did not go to every other museum in the country and just take all of their black history. Um, we did the opposite. We went into communities and we said, um, please tell us your stories. What are the objects you might have been holding on to? Not necessarily just so that we can take them back to DC, but so that we can know they're there and we can help you care for them and help you preserve them in your own communities. So a lot of the way that ways that objects came to us, we were seeking things out. You know, Russell Williams here is the first African-American to win two Academy Awards he's a one of one story. So those uh, Oscars came back to our storage facility in my car from his office at American University that beautiful afternoon. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking for the stories we know we have to tell, these iconic moments, these, these necessary elements to the narratives as we are also learning and um, adding other stories we didn't even know existed with objects we never knew we never knew we could find, let alone start to look for. Um, and as a result, we are also building a community of contributors, of object owners, of people who believed in the vision for what this museum would be and could be and should be. Um, and as you can see here, we weren't even you know, open yet. And Nona and I were out doing public programs. We were out talking about her legacy and her work. Um, and so there's this wonderful uh, coming together of people who finally feel like there's a place for their story, there's a place for their object. Um, and that place is a nationally, internationally recognized location on the National Mall. 
Um, of course, you had to get the hard hat picture. And that was the very first day of object installation. You can see the mothership in the background. Um, and so all of these things come together with this museum in particular, as I, as I said, that really demonstrates a shift in um, museum as a museum work, curatorial work in particular, because we are very non-traditional in our collecting methods, if you will. Um, I cannot get away with a lot of the things I could get away with back then. Um, uh, whether that's hanging out with En Vogue in their storage unit, and then here they are finally seeing some of their things on display. Um, but also what deserves to be in a museum, what stories belong in the museum setting, and what are the different kinds of objects, I was absolutely crying in this picture, what are the kinds of objects that you can use to tell those stories and getting creative. I use the J. Dilla equipment as an example of that. Equipment as instrument, um, using someone who is a producer in music to talk about all these different genres and all these different ways um, that that one person shaped um, pop music. Um, and so all of that, all of that to say, like, I approach things from a very eclectic perspective um, in terms of my experience, my work. As Stephanie mentioned, I contributed to eight of our 11 inaugural exhibitions including the sports gallery. I, I am a contemporary cultural history person, but sports was a brand new you know, thing for me to learn along the way. Um, and I'm always thinking inclusively about our audiences. It's not, not just the people who walk into the building. It is our virtual visitors online. It is the folks who will buy a book you know, and, and have that shipped to their home in Oklahoma or wherever they might live, but they might never come to DC. Um, it's the people who attend our public program. Stephanie shout out our block party. We had 16,000 people on the mall um, a couple weeks ago for our second block party. And every single moment that we have, every single opportunity we have to engage with the public is very much in alignment with the mission and the vision for the museum, um, for the responsibility that we have. And again, that, that those of us who are content, whether that be exhibition, programs, what have you, or all of the above, like I kind of have fallen into, that we are dedicated to continuing to build those communities, continuing to serve those communities, um, identify new ones and welcome new folks as um, necessary and um, as we're asked to do so. Um, and all of that can be demonstrated through the cur curatorial work. And for me personally, a lot of that comes from the power of the material culture. And so I try to focus on the objects um, as much as possible. So um, that is my little kind of overview. I hope I kept to time, um, but for moments like this, this is Andre 3000 seeing the poster that inspired him to create Stankonia as a place at the center of the earth, um, which even though it isn't in outer space, it's still very much Afrofuturistic. So being able to have that moment where he's unrolling this poster that hung in his bedroom wall um, in his early twenties and seeing it for the first time since then, and these stories come flowing out of his brain. And so I'm there to capture them. I'm there to capture those stories and make sure that they don't get lost um, and make sure that they can be shared um, in, our various, in our various spaces and platforms. So thank you very much. I will turn it over uh, to the rest of our, our afternoon. Thank you, Kolo, uh, Timothy, sorry. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, fab always, we're all museum junkies here, so we all love to see be behind the scenes photos at all times. Can't have too many of them, right? Um, and I, what is so exciting for me about being able to have both of you together here is that we get this broad national Smithsonian perspective, and then, which, you know, not that many of us are ever gonna end up working with Smithsonian, but a lot of us are gonna end up working in um, organizations that are scrappy and figuring it out and um, and figuring out ways to expand their reach, ways to deepen their reach. And that's exactly, I think, what Kalolo is doing at Alma Lewis. So, so let's hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for this invitation and Peter, who's working behind the scenes. And I do have a few images that I wanted to share with the audience, just to orient them about um, some of my practice and how I got here. Uh, I am the product of the Deep South. I was born in Greenwood, Mississippi, a uh, product of the 70s. Uh, my parents moved up north for their um, 
their their education, their graduate work, and uh, ended up I ended up staying up north for college and uh, living in Pittsburgh and spending the majority of my professional career in Pittsburgh. And I've had the great fortune to be able to work uh, in a lot of the mainstream white led museums in Pittsburgh from doing internships unpaid at the Carnegie Museum of Art, uh, which was an eye opener for me and to work uh, at the Andy Warhol Museum and also do internships at the Natchez Factory. Uh, and so working both in nonprofit and then also for profit and um, doing just a wide variety of things just to kind of get a holistic sense of who I am as a human being, but then also how do I see myself in my pro professional career. And so working in a lot of these mainstream museums in Pittsburgh, I always uh, was questioning why I did not see people that looked like me. And I did see people that looked like me, but not necessarily in senior positions. There were wonderful people working uh, in security or custodial or in the cafeteria, but I was just like, we as black people are very expansive. And, and so that gives you a certain kind of lens in which you, you kind of relegate black people to only being in these positions of servitude, working in museums. And so I set out in, in um, 2016 to bring a lot of these cultural thinkers, curators, art critics, working full-time artists to Pittsburgh to connect with the institutions and also to the cultural workers and also black people in Pittsburgh because a lot of my colleagues at these mainstream museums were always telling me, Kololo, um, I, we, we, we just can't find people that you're talking about. And I'm like, well, I travel and I, I see folks in various different museums, whether it's a cultural institution or a fine arts museum, small, big, medium size. I just think that some of my colleagues weren't doing the necessary work. So I said, if you're not gonna go out to those people, I'm gonna bring those people into Pittsburgh. And so that's what I did. And I started uh, uh, um, an initiative called By Any Means. And I reached out to some of my uh, peers in, in the art world and two of them, which Jessica Lynn and Taylor Aldridge, who started Wonderful Writers and Taylor Aldridge is a curator, they started Arts.Black, which is art writing from a Black perspective. And Jessica and I uh, worked together to put on the first By Any Means at the Carnegie Museum of Art. And so we put our heads together and created this, this wonderful list of um, artists, curators, and art critics. And I just wanted to list and acknowledge the people that participated in this three-day symposium. And uh, from Alicia B. Wormsley, D.S. Kenzel, Ta Taylor Aldridge, Tiona uh, Nakia McClodin, Ike, uh, Jessica Lynn, Rujeko Hockley, uh, Thaddeus Mosley, and, and Nathaniel Donay. And so we came here, uh, they all came here for three days. We did tours. Uh, Peter, you can um, advance to the next uh, set of uh, slides, please. Thank you. Uh, we met with the directors and curators uh, uh, at um, the Carnegie Museum of Art and the Warhol to look at their collection, have a deeper conversation. We had uh, led uh, two sessions where each of the invited guests talked about their own practice uh, in context of where they are situated situated where they live and their backgrounds as well. Here we are on the left at the Andy Warhol Museum when Eric Shiner was the director at that time. And we literally were just engaged in conversations and discussions and ways to improve collections, ways to improve audience viewership, all of that stuff. And uh, just to really kind of get the boots on the ground instead of kind of looking at it from afar. We also did studio visits where Thaddeus Mosley here, who recently turned 97, he is a very active sculptor. Uh, we went to visit him. He was also a participant on the panel, talked about his practice. Uh, he's one of those kind of under-recognized seminal artists. He's now getting some shine finally. 
um, in his ninth decade on this planet. And it was just really wonderful to expose the folks from the outside coming to Pittsburgh on what was going on in Pittsburgh. And there are all these wonderful connections that were made from the first launch of By Any Means. And so the next uh, set of slides, in 2017, uh, the Carnegie Museum of Art uh, put together this 2020 exhibition between the Studio Museum of Harlem and the Carnegie Museum of Art. And one of my colleagues, uh, Eric Crosby, who was the curator of modern and contemporary art at the time, but now is the director of the museum, uh, had asked me to do some programming, by any means programming, in con uh, connection to the collection that was going to be on view during 2020, which would be 20 works of art from each you know, respective museum. And so what I did was I challenged the museum to allow an outsider uh, to engage, to activate the galleries. And so having these relationships with the museum was really important because they knew of my you know, professional career and knowing that I want to really engage a wider audience and it was to their benefit, they actually said yes. And it was the first time they allowed an outsider to really uh, activate their galleries during, um, you know, the exhibitions, of course. And so what I did was I brought in scholars, I brought in writers, I brought in artists to talk from their perspective uh, about two to three works of art and each program that we did during the course of this exhibition sold out. Uh, the gentleman on the left, Dr. Augustus Brown Jr., who's the first African-American to get his PhD in art history at the University of Pittsburgh, who's one of my long-term uh, time uh, mentors, actually uh, uh, lived in Harlem and knew Linda Br uh, Good Bryant, just above Midtown, he knew a lot of these artists from Howardina Pendel to Sangha Ngudi uh, um, and just so many different artists from the 60s and 70s. And he could talk about this wealth of knowledge that a lot of us contemporary curators didn't have because we weren't alive then. Uh, and so he was able to kind of contextualize, say, Kara Walker's work with David Hammond's, which he's holding up David Hammond's work. And so even the curators and the educators from the museums were like, wow, we, you know, this is a different perspective that adds to the scholarship of both these artists and also um, just the museum field as a whole. And you also see Thaddeus Mosley speaking about Mel Edwards, one of his wonderful friends, and just sharing stories about his connection to Mel, Melvin Edwards. And, and so, and then the other uh, people uh, in the lower left are two uh, artists by the name of Naomi Chambers and Mary Martin. And they were able to pick specific artists like Titus Kafar uh, and really talk about uh, their work in relation to the, them working as a practicing artist. Uh, so the next um, slides are, once again, this is just, just wanted to show people some of the programming that was happening in the, in the, in the um, galleries. And Ben Jones, who I know through a wonderful men mentor of mine, uh, Charlotte Ka, uh, she introduced me to Ben Jones and we brought him because he was in the show but um, the museums weren't programming him. And so we were like, oh, let's bring him and have him talk about his work alongside Charlotte Ka as well. And also I wanted to, I've always been the kind of person who as a curator, as a cultural worker, as an arts administrator, always acknowledging the people that look over the collection those people that have the most eyes and the most time that they spend with the collection when it's on view. And it's usually the security guards. So having no been going, going to the Carnegie Museum of Art for a long, long time and working at the Warhol, I got to know a lot of the security guards and they got to know me. And so building up a relationship with them. So I asked two of the security guards to 
talk about works of art that were really artists that, that really spoke to them. And I found out as well over the course of the years of getting know, to know some of these security guards that some of them were artists, preacher, graphic designer, uh, a former police officer. And so they wove those stories into how they were looking at the works of art that they selected uh, um, at, during, by any means, uh, programming for uh, 2020. Uh, the next slide, please. And so fast forward, just a year later, I was the consulting curator for the August Wilson Center, uh, uh, African American Cultural Center. And I staged uh, a concurrent, as I say, the Black International during the Carnegie International. Uh, we're very scrappy, as you said, Stephanie. Uh, we didn't have the budget that the Carnegie International had, but I was going to make it work. So I created a group show, invited the 12 participants that you see on the right there to literally activate the entire building at the August Wilson Cultural, uh, African American Cultural Center. And it was not because I curated, but it was a spectacular show of artists that spanned multiple generations. You have Martha Jackson Jarvis, who is a woman an artist working uh, for the past, what I would say 50, uh, 55 years. She is of the same era of Carrie James Marshall. She has been mentored by Sam Gilliam. Once again, Martha Jackson Jarvis is one of those under-recognized artists. Uh, um, to her daughter and Gina Suri Jarvis, uh, to a wide variety of artists, Taj Rust, who's actually right now in Pittsburgh um, at Alma Lewis doing his artist residency here. And so, all of these artists that uh, were in this group show, uh, we still keep in contact, building relationships because I want to work with these artists throughout their career and help support them, help write about their work. And it's a reciprocal uh, in engagement. Uh, next slide, please. Just going to show you some of the work. So what I also did was when we had the opening, it was uh, the day after the Carnegie International opening. We also had the artists just in conversation with each other, along with some of the staff at the August Wilson Center. And it was really a wonderful way to have this cross dialogue among these artists and this kind of exchange of ideas. And it was so beautiful to witness and to partake in. And a lot of, of, of friendships were made uh, and and that's what for me my job as a curator is one of the great things that I feel like we need we we should be doing is creating those experiences not only between like a facilitator between the artist and the viewer with the art objects but also across uh, colleagues. Next slide, please. Uh, Stephen Towns, Declaration of Resistance. This is an artist that Timothy and I have in common. Stephen was in Familiar Boundaries, Infinite Possibilities. I always say he's my art husband. Uh, as I had the great fortune of working with Stephen on a almost three year journey for him to basically create uh, about 40 works, both paintings and quilts for his solo show that traveled to three different museums called Stephen Town's Declaration of Resistance. And Stephen is a storyteller. He looks at um, untold stories or undertold stories. And this, we really worked collaboratively on this from me writing, for him looking at my writing, me recording him, us looking at archives. And uh, this show really struck a chord with all of the museums. Um, it's just the, the attendance records were very, very high. I think it broke attendance records at all of the museums. That's where I met uh, Stephanie. Uh, Stephen and I continue to collaborate. Uh, he's going to be coming to Pittsburgh next year for a residency. So um, we did an exhibition publication. It was a labor of love. Uh, our next slide. Just wanted to give you a little context of the layout of the show. Stephen highlighted uh, coal miners. I, before working with Stephen, 
I did not ever imagine black people as coal miners, not that we didn't exist, but my thought of a person, a coal miner was a white person, quite honestly. And so Stephen was like, hey, here, here's some archives that I'm looking at and, and here are some images. What do you think? Uh, source material for, for the, the paintings, these, these mixed media paintings that he did. And it was just so mind blowing for me that as a curator, I was learning so much from an artist and that's what my work is all about. I would say the central work of my, as a jo my job as a curator is to expand the narrative, to expand my mind and to learn as much as I possibly can. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the quilts along with some of the wonderful paintings that Stephen did from you know white rice rice uh, rice workers um, to fishermen. I mean, it's they're just stunning. They're 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 stunning works, and I very encourage you to look Stephen Towns up. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So fast forward from by any means, I turned that into I rolled that into my nonprofit that I launched back in I incorporated in 2017. And I now have four core programs around Alma Lewis. Uh, the mission of Alma Lewis, it is an experimental contemporary art platform for critical thinking, constructive dialogue, and creative expression dedicated to Black culture. And I run a artist residency, which is three months. I have a gallery program, exhibitions. And I also run the Black Archive, which, uh, next slide, please. This is my space, my gallery space. And this is the show of Amani Lewis reimagining care. Um, Amani was our inaugural gallery artist in uh, fall of 2021. Next slide, please. And these are some of our resident artists. This is the studio, uh, Mujani Merriweather. She was here a year ago. Um, and then below, uh, Yao Wusu, who is originally from outside of Accra, uh, from Kamasi. Ghana, and he spends his time between Accra and uh, Brooklyn. And Mujani is a Baltimore-based artist. Uh, so next slide, please. This is Lizanya Cruz performing inquiry. She's from the Dominican Republic and spends her time between Santo Domingo and um, Brooklyn. And then just wanted to show you a little bit of the Black Archive. We have to date over 750 books, journals, ephemera, and art objects and counting. And then we also have by any means, uh, the symposium and that we're gonna be rolling out and partnering with the Frick Museum this fall. We're gonna have four speakers, so stay tuned to that. And then the last slide is just where you can find more information about me and Alma Lewis is our website, my Instagram and Alma Lewis Instagram. So thank you. That's wonderful, Kalolo. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't everybody wanna go like hang out in the gallery now? Right. Then wouldn't that be fabulous if we could all go and like walk through and, and see some of Stephen Town's work or see some um, see some of those that terrific material culture that that Timothy has collected. Um, so I'm going to open it up for uh, for broader questions um, in a minute. But but first, I want to. I want to ask you both about. Um, about what you bring to the curatorial model. Um, so, you know, one of the courses that we teach in our program is on curatorship. But one of the things that we talk about is how, um, you know, the, first of all, everybody who, everybody in the world thinks that there's only one job in a museum and that's the curator's job, right? Um, and what does a curator look like? Well, maybe they look like me. Maybe they look like Timothy. They probably don't look like Kamala, right? So how are we changing that model? And how does that model, you know, we all we all grew up going to museums in which we we looked at the art and we read the label and and our vessels were filled, right? We learned. We were blank slates and we learned and we and we learned kind of sort of what we already suspected and what we already knew who had been taught us as being the things that were important. Um, but it was a very much 
um, I'm here, here, take it. it. It was not a creating a space for conversation, right? Now, with Kalolo's show at Rinalda House, one of the things that was so exciting to me about it was seeing books from the Black Archive on the wall available and puzzles. There was a puzzle. People, there was a puzzle of Stephen Town's work and people sat down and did it. Total strangers sat down, and did this puzzle together and had conversations about the art, okay? Um, it, they pulled the books off the shelves and they sat down in comfortable chairs and looked at the books. Um, so how does that kind of curatorial model indicate this shift in where, where we're going as a field? Tammy, do you want to take that first? Um, sure. I mean, well, one of the things, and Stephanie, I know you and I have talked about this at length, um, you know, the, the title or, or word curator is often tossed around these days quite, quite liberally. Um, and I think that, you know, that's great, but also not so great in, in many ways. Uh, the idea that people are taking ownership and responsibility for the work they do and and using the word curator as a way to demonstrate their intention and thought behind the, the work. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> actual curatorial work in a museum setting or the role of a curator in that kind of a space is a very specific thing or has been a very specific thing. Um, and I, I, I kind of the only perspective we have is our own uh, in terms of uh, lived life. I definitely came in at like this hinge moment mm -hmm. for what that job mm -hmm. was and what it is now. I came in a time where, yes, as the uh, as as a as a young woman, a young white woman at that, I was still one of the most diverse perspectives at the table, mm -hmm. which is a huge problem, you know. Um, a collection is only as inclusive and diverse as the folks putting it together, like most of the time. Um, and, you know, the the realities of um, what museums need their staff to do um, it, it now in the present moment. And this may be kind of shifting a little bit away from the focus question you have, but the realities of budget limitations, um, the ways that how museums can can support their staff. Uh, it's not necessarily possible for the model of what a museum org chart <laughs> looked like in the 70s that doesn't translate to today. One, because you need additional people like social media, like the public affairs, you know, world is um, wildly different today than it would have been, you know, 10, let alone 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but also like not every museum, even the Smithsonian, uh, and we have 19 of them, um, has the luxury of hiring one person for one job. Yeah. We just don't. And, um, you know, in my work with smaller organizations, it's worse. Um, so. The, the need for people to have a variety of skill sets to be able to come to a job interview and say, yes, I'm applying for the job as a curator. However, I'm also trained as blah, 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 blah. I also know how to install objects. I can support this work. I am, um, I am, I have experience in raising money. <laughs> like that's a big thing too. You know, like we all have to support ourselves. Um, and, being able to one being willing to be to being open to all of those things because there's also this idea we have to dismantle this hierarchical system that's in place within the museum structure itself where the curators are way up here and everybody else is way down there and that's what the work that you know we just learned about really began to dismantle the idea that absolutely Oftentimes our security, our security, whatever, I hate calling them support staff. They're not, that's not, that belittles the role of all of these people. Mm -hmm. One, also because I came up through that, that system and that structure. I am actively working to dismantle the structure I benefited from, to be clear, with the inherent privilege I brought to the table as a young white woman. 
but like it's recognizing that it's not it's not just one thing anymore for anybody we all have responsibilities to come best equipped best prepared to be able to 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 unfortunately oftentimes do things that are not in our job description um but also know that in order for um a, a museum or anywhere, a collecting institution to be successful, they need people to, I, you know, wear many hats, right? Like to be able to step into situations. I mean, that's why I was part of, I was the only person from curatorial in the museum for three and a half months during object installation, because I could be trusted holding objects. Not every curator can <laughs> be trusted to hold objects. And I hate, yeah. Like, no, Sorry. yeah, but that's yeah. just now that, that is a reality. I mean, I, I think about how I came into this. I didn't know what a curator was until I went into college, actually. But I know that I come from storytellers, and yeah. so I always I'm just about dissolving silos within these structures mm-hmm. uh, because I was director of development at the Andy Warhol Museum. But it didn't mean I wasn't a curator because I know that I curated as well, but not there at that point in time. Uh, however, uh, I, I think that we're so the, the the way in which the museum is structured right now. I mean, they're trying, but it's kind of impenetrable to bring down those walls. And yeah. so, curators, educators, development people, communications people can interact together because. I feel like it's much stronger instead of us trying to hoard onto things, uh, just sharing our knowledge because being an expert in your field is really, it really, really, it's just very important, but also creating a team of people is more important than just what you know, as a, as an individual. Right. Right. And And I'll do a seamless plug for the program that you all, most of you are in because it's not enough as you know, was just said to come to the table and just be really smart about something like that's great good for you what are you going to do with that knowledge what is the practical application of that knowledge Mm -hmm. you know and so you can have seven phds walk into a room and not know how to make an exhibition you know you may know how to write a book and write a dissertation but you don't know how to write labels it's not the same thing Mm -hmm. and so this program does a great job of you know presenting a well-rounded amount of information from multiple perspectives, you get to pick your entry point and what your emphasis is. But, you know, we gone are the days of like, you simply get hired because you've got a couple degrees, but like, although the museum is required, (laughs) we do require still for you to have a PhD. I don't have a PhD. I do not have yeah. people think I have a PhD based on the knowledge that I have. I, I, I gain that knowledge by being boots on the ground, spending a lot of time in libraries and archives. My first memory was being in, 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 a, in, in a library. But I also wanted to just share that kind of like my methodology of curating because people always ask me, I, this is so unusual. I remember incorporating books. I've always done that with shows and people would poo poo it and think that that books don't belong in exhibitions and fast forward. Now you see more people incorporating them. And I actually saw that in a historic society in, in Mississippi. And it just, for me, it was very normal with these art objects or, you know, we would call, I would call it an art object, but it was somebody's family heirloom or something. But for me, I never backed down on advocating for what I believe in advocating for the rights of the artists, Mm -hmm. because usually those kind of get, pushed aside because we tend, we live in a society capitalist model of really censuring the funder. And it's, it's for me, I want to decenter that because putting the people, especially the artists and the cultural workers in foregrounding them uh, is, is the way in which we can just have a much more expansive Mm -hmm. way of engaging. Absolutely. and yeah. so books belong everywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so having Stephen Towns Declaration of Resistance in what you experienced, Stephanie, people loved it. People mm-hmm. in, in, yeah. in people love to be able to look at a work of art. Then we had a display case of some of the source material. And then you had books that give you a deeper dive into 
some of the information that Stephen created, beautifully created. And then for me, it's my job to just kind of be the, uh, uh, um, I, would, I, I just always say the, the um, second to the artist and I'm never competing. My voice is not to out-compete over, over talk, um, talk mm -hmm. over the artist. It's really to complement what the artist envisioned. And for me to also uh, help the artist see things that they that they may not have seen and for the artist to help me envision things that I might not have seen. So right. that's I wanna, right. I yes. wanna I wanna hop in here. Um and because speaking of Stephen Towns, he is thank here you. with us. <laughs> <laughs> so so thank you thanks for joining Stephen. that's pretty fun um and he has a question he says thank you both uh can can you talk a bit about the complications of funding a project or exhibit and how you work around those Whew. so sure. you, you should be able to do that in like 10, <laughs> 10 or 30 seconds i think that's a that's a quick answer right right it's like how much time do you have um <laughs> I'm not building relationships because uh, I, I know that I, I had to, I had to help fundraise. It's mm. a story of my life. I mean, most of the projects initiatives that I did, like by any means, was not supported by foundations because mm. the work that I was doing was outside their grant guidelines. Now it's they're considering that after I raised money and people supported me because they really believed in the work that I was doing, and so. I took, like, by any means, raised twenty thousand dollars. Went to the foundation and said, "Hey, here's the money I raised. Can you match it?" Uh, those right. are the kinds of things that I do. Uh, I mean, same with Alma Lewis. It was individual donors, quarter of a million dollars that I raised to get Alma Lewis up and running. So um, it, it's not everybody's able to raise money, but it is a reality uh, to, as a curator, to have to help raise. Uh, money for your own projects. But that's why building those relationships with development people, philanthropists, uh, yeah. is really critical to yeah. and artists out there. And even here, like I think a lot of people have this idea that the Smithsonian has all the money and all the resources in the world, and we a thousand percent do not. You know, the Afrofuturism where that Stephen, Stephen is currently featured. He is one of a handful of folks who um, have work or a presence in more than one exhibition in the museum at once. So he is simultaneously in the visual art space reckoning and in the Afrofuturism exhibition. So that is a, you and Nona Hendricks and George Clinton and Benjamin Banneker and Phyllis Wheatley and like a handful of others have that distinction. Um, but, you know, even using Afrofuturism in that exhibition as an example, you know, it, every, every exhibition you see in that temporary gallery we had to raise money for. Any um, project, the block party, public program, um, publication, we have, to, we have to find funding for those things. Um, the federal budget is, you know, a crapshoot. Often we don't know what we're gonna get. Um, and so we have to plan for the federal money that comes in to keep the building open, to keep the lights on, to, you know, pay those federal salaries. and pay the electric bill, literally. Um, so we are on uh, in, in a very similar situation. It's not necessarily as dire as smaller community museums. I would never suggest that, um, but we're also free. All Smithsonian museums are and always will be free. And so we do not have ticket sales to support. You know, So behind the scenes, what you don't see is, um, well, you may see, like last night, there was a big gala here. Some organization made a significant financial donation to the museum to use the space. Can't call it renting because it's a federal building. But that's how we can offset, you know, some of that. But we are, our, our development office is huge. They are busy all year round, um, raising money for what the public sees, as well as the behind the scenes stuff that's not as sexy. Like nobody likes to pay for the supplies or the, you know, who wants to say I support with archive with archival boxes? Like nobody wants that. They want their name in the gallery. They want to say this is public recognition of what we did. Mm -hmm. um, but we're constantly, constantly faced with limitations around 
just do we have the do we have the money and then do we have the staff to support it can the staff manage time um, appropriately but it's a it's and especially in a place like like this like I said where there are there are ideas about what it is and how we function that don't always align with the realities um but you know that it yeah, yeah. it's what you it's what you deal with and and I, I would love I to think just all museums should be free because you just see a wide variety of people everywhere I was just in St. Louis yeah. and mm-hmm. you just mm-hmm. and it's it's it is a human right just like mm-hmm. drinking water that yeah. museums cultural yeah. institutions should be free yeah and I mean as as an employee of the Smithsonian I am a public servant and that is something that like I said before, I take very seriously. Mm-hmm. Everything we do is in service to the public. I'm a public historian, cultural, you, whatever you want to call it, all of those things, yeah. um, because that's the mission for this yeah. institution. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's by the way, you know, a research institution before it's a conglomerate of museums. Like we exist as, as a research facility first and foremost, and that's another part of the 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 narrative around the Smithsonian that a lot of people don't always. Yeah. Um, don't always know it's publicly available as much as it can be we have two minutes left ah! right how unbelievable is that we could we could we're just getting started we're just getting started um but I want to and we have a whole bunch of questions and we're not going to be able to answer all of them and I wish we were and you know maybe someday in some perfect world this will be a a whole seminar but Today, we have two more minutes, and here's the last question I want to ask. is from Rashida Witter, and she says, many thanks to you both. As two curators with years of experience, what advice can you share for an emerging museum worker who has a similar curatorial ethos, but is not yet in a position of power to implement ideas? I mean, to be honest, do not look at any existing blueprint for a career, a, a, a career trajectory, a path that exists as something you have to imitate or follow. Um, none of the positions I've held at the Smithsonian have existed prior to the need being demonstrated for them. Um, and I know that that's not necessarily the norm, but things are changing so quickly um that one get all the experience you can possibly get in whatever area it is like just be present as much as you can be and think about how does because so much of the work we do is in public service it is not about me right as as Kilo mentioned earlier it's not actually about us it's not about our voices it's not about our version of anything and being in positions where we work with folks who are very much alive I can call Nona or Chuck or Andre and be like, hey, I'm fact checking this thing. I wanna make sure I get it right. It is centering their story and creating a space where their stories belong. Create what what is the way that your work is contributing to this larger good? If you're saying you have a kind of similar ethos, you know what I mean? Like, right. and how does that align with you as a human being? Right. The work right. you have to do yes. around authenticity, yes. mm-hmm. like your, because, mm-hmm. I am I am in a position at a museum where I am telling stories of communities I am not from. So therefore, I am constantly decentering myself and mm-hmm. elevating and 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 as I said, like tapping into stories um, that have not been put in books. There's nowhere to go research these things. We're creating the primary source yep. in real time. Yep. And yep. It's about yep. giving them that. And so, how is how is your work and your mm-hmm. how are your professional interests in alignment with who you are? Mm-hmm. And how are you able to create a path for yourself that is truly unique to you while also leading, you got to get a paycheck, you got to have a job, yeah. like all those practical yeah. things. But like, what is the long game yeah. in a way that, you know, you're not just saying, okay, well, this is what someone else did, or here's what I'm told I should do. Um, yeah. What is the best fit for you as yeah. you're being aware of how things are changing constantly? Okay. If I, all right. Um, um, Timothy, I'm going to stop you. We're at 11.01. So we're going to be a little bit over. Okay. But we got to hear, we got to hear from Kamala on this. Yeah. Don't compare yourself to other people because you are who you are. You're uniquely you. And I always say, because my mother and my dad always said, you got to do the work. Yep. And 
you have to work at what you believe that you want to manifest in doing that work. And it, it's doing the work when nobody's looking, actually. Uh, so you'll be ready for an opportunity and also not waiting for something to come to you. Seek things, seek opportunities out and create your own team, your 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 extended family, your art family. That's something that for me, it's taken a village to get me here and it's going to continue to uh, uh, my village to to. to push me forward. Um, uh, somebody had asked about is, uh, is, is Alamo Lewis a nonprofit? Yes, we are. We always, we always started out as a nonprofit. Uh, so I always, I just always say to younger people, you know, fi find your tribe and always do, do the work and don't, don't look at somebody else. It's great to have role models, but you are who you are. And I know nowadays with social media, it's so easily to be oh, this is a shiny, bright, shiny object, but um, just really focus on yourself and do the work and, 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 and find your tribe and don't be afraid to ask questions as well and put yourself out there. And, and if you don't see the work being done or a, a place for the work to be done, create that place. You have a wonderful example of that, right? I'm, I'm gesturing to you on my screen. You probably can't tell, but you have a wonderful yeah. Example yeah. one creating yeah. a space for yeah. the work she needed to yeah. see in the yeah. world and you know it, it may start small but it's still something yeah thank you well thank you so much this has just been fabulous um i many of you know that i'm on the west coast so it's only 11 o'clock in the morning for me but i feel like my day is over and i <laughs> am i am just gonna i am just gonna levitate around my office for the rest of the day because this is so inspiring and you all are so brilliant and so generous and we are so grateful for you giving us this time thank you everyone for joining us we're going to do another one of these it might not be transcendent but we're going to do the best we can <laughs> on november the 8th we're going to do it on november the 8th with um, curator Liz Melliker from the Presidio Trust in San Francisco and executive director Saber Moore from the Carter County Museum in Ekalaka, Montana. Um, oh. And they are going to be talking about citizen science. Um, completely different, but we're still going to we're still going to have a great conversation and I hope many of you can join us. Thank you so much, Timothy and Kalolo. And thank you as always to Peter for running this and making it look thank so easy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And thank you. Hello. And, and I, I, I don't speak for all of us, but I always, I always say, if you have further questions, anything that we can do to be helpful, please do not hesitate to reach out. You saw our emails, our Instagrams or whatever. Don't be shy. We're here and we're here to help. Absolutely. 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 Right. Thank you so much. Take care.